We are now in the main lecture notebook, part A lecture notebook for module four. In this module, and in particular this part A lecture notebook, we will discuss root finding and numerical integration. Optimization is a topic that's left for the homework notebook of this module. Now, a quick note about calculus concepts and our use of interactive visualizations with widgets is really in order here. While the topics we're discussing in this Part A lecture notebook and in the external activity for it, as well as the homework notebook, are often commonly studied as applications of calculus concepts, and we'll make many passing references to these calculus concepts, you actually do not need to know calculus to follow the narratives. This is, of course, not to say that you should not seek to master calculus at some point. We will simply give some intuitive discussion involving what these calculus concepts mean or how they're important to understanding the motivation for these problems. But our focus is really on the big picture ideas and how we can use interactive graphics powered by a widgets module that you're now familiar with from previous lecture notebooks to help us explore these ideas. So this is really just showing you how we can implement some simple algorithms they're really not that complex. The actual amount of code that we need to do the numerical integration or the root finding is actually not that much. Most of our code is actually spent in terms of visualizing what's going on so that you can do visual storytelling and learn how to annotate graphs and help see how to make that part of the problem solving procedure, the visualization aspect of the solutions to these problems. So our specific learning objectives at a high level for this Part A lecture notebook are to understand what a root finding problem means and how they arise in practice. We also want to understand how to create annotations and utilize interactive widgets to enhance visualizations of data. We want to understand what integration means and how it arises in practical applications. And we also want to know how to use classes and subclasses to help solve root finding and integration problems. So with that, we're ready to get started. What does root finding mean? Simply put, given a function f of x, a root of the function is just some point x equals c, so some value of the input, let's call that c, such that f of c is equal to zero. So it's, a, it's an input that makes the function equal to zero. That's it. That's what the roots of a function are. Now, why do we care about that? We'll get to that in a moment, but let's actually look at how we might visualize what the root of a function is, because this will be part of the visual storytelling aspect of what we're after in solving these computational applications. So we're going to look at some lambda functions first, but we're first going to review a little bit more about lambda functions. So we mentioned these lambda functions briefly in the Part B lecture notebook for module three, but they were primarily in the context of list comprehensions. So you may want to review that briefly for some more context because they were very useful for constructing lists very quickly, and they were known as these anonymous functions, but they're really useful here. And you're going to see that if the way in which they're useful here is actually quite general and perhaps very useful for exploring many computational algorithms that involve an input parameter that is itself a function. So what is a lambda function exactly? Well, I provided some links that you can click on to read more about them, and I really encourage you to. But the main takeaway is that if you have a simple type of anonymous function that you just need for a short period of time in your code, then a lambda function is probably right for you. It is absolutely positively not necessary to use these, but they are useful. A generic use syntax we care about would look something like this, f equal to lambda, and then the arguments, meaning the parameters of that function, and then a colon, and then the expression that evaluates those arguments. So here's a very simple example. f equals lambda, and then the arguments, the inputs to that function, also we would call them parameters in our Python lingo of how we think of inputs to a function, x, y, z. We have the colon, and then we just take 3 times x minus 2 times y plus 4 times z. And because it is a function, you would evaluate it just like anything else. I'm going to run this code here. And when I evaluate f of 1, 2, comma 3, then that will be putting 1 in for x, 2 in for y, and 3 in for z. So you can see that that would be 3 minus 2 times 2 would be 4, so there's negative 1, plus 4 times 3, which is 12. So I believe the output of this should be 11. There we go. The output is 11. And you could just play around with that to see that that is what's going on, that the first argument is x, the second one is y, and the third one is z. Now let's run the code cells below to see an example of a lambda function in the context of plotting the roots of a polynomial. 
And this is getting towards what our ultimate goal is, or one of our learning objectives for this notebook. Now, I want you to pay attention throughout this lecture notebook, how we use these types of lambda functions. You're going to see them being used over and over again. At times, we treat these as treat these as completely anonymous functions in the sense that we pass them directly into algorithms that need a function without formally defining them anywhere else in the code. This allows us to study how the algorithms perform on different types of functions very rapidly without having to formally declare or create the functions elsewhere in the code. We never have to assign the lambda function to a variable like we're assigning this lambda function to the variable f. Just like when we define a function, we do that DEF and then write a function name, that's like assigning the routine that we're programming in that function to the variable name that we're defining. But we can sometimes do not do that at all. And that's what the lambda functions allow us to do is kind of get away with not having to do this. You'll see examples. Basically, they're just a simple matter of convenience and they're a useful thing to be aware of. So here I'm going to create a polynomial without further ado. That's going to be x cubed minus x minus 2. Remember to raise to a power you do x and then you have that two time symbols in a row. Now I need to use numpy and matplotlib in my plots below. So now all right here's a crash course in using plots to tell a story in two easy steps. Step one plot your stuff. Now a lot of this is going to look familiar. I'm creating a figure. I'm going ahead and giving it a number. That's a kind of a convention I'm used to. You can assign figure numbers to figures and it's really useful to often do that in other environments where you're more limited in memory than like what Google Colab has this give because you can kind of reuse that figure and plot over it instead of having to create new figures that are storing up space in memory. So that's just a kind of a habit I have, but it's a good habit to have, I think. Now I'm going to create 100 uniformly spaced points between negative 1 and 2, including negative 1 and 2. I'm going to assign that array to the variable x, and then I'm just going to plot f of x versus x. This is very familiar. I'm going to plot it as a blue line, and I'm going to make it line width 2. So that's this is all very familiar to you, this type of plotting. We've been doing this for a while, since like Part C Lecture Notebook of Module 3, we've really been plotting functions a little bit more, and in the Prologue Lecture Notebook as well. Now I'm going to plot some prototypical x and y axes and so i'm using the axv line function within the pyplot module that i've imported as plt from matplotlib so it has a function called axv line that's pl plotting a vertical line like an axis and i'm saying where do i want to plot it what x value well x equals zero corresponds to the y axis i want to make that a line with one a dotted line and make it black and similarly i'm going to use axh line h for horizontal line, I'm going to plot that at y equals 0, which is a typical x-axis location. And then I'm going to plot the root of that polynomial. How did I get that? Well, let's just leave that aside for now. But I happen to know that c equals 1.521 is approximately the root of the function. This is approximately where the function is equal to 0. I'm going to use the scatter function within the pyplot module to plot the point c f of c and I'm going to plot it with a size of 70 for the marker that is going to be a square and it's going to be color red. You can read more about this in the documentation. You can just do a simple Google of this scatter. Actually, you can also hover your cur cursor over and look at this. Like This is just describing the marker size again, colors. You can just see examples or you could Google for more information about the documentation. So I highly recommend looking at documentation. I don't really like reading the documentation inside of um, Google Colab, but it's there for convenience if you need it. But you could just read more about how different marker styles that you could choose from, color options you have, and the S is just the size of the markers that you're plotting. So this is just plotting the stuff. I'm plotting the, there, give me cursor out of the way. I'm plotting the function. I'm plotting some X and Y axes, and I'm plotting the root as a point marked with a square. Now, the second thing, if you really want to do some you know, visual storytelling is you need to annotate your plot. You need to add informational text to it. This could be adding things like a useful title. And here I'm just showing a way to take things like the like this root value and the approximate function value and create a string based on that numerical information that I then plot the title. I use the title function within that uh, pyplot module to add this to the figure and I'm going to choose the font size to be 14, and then I'm going to do some fancier annotations. We've done titles that we've added to plots. We've done uh, labels 
to create legends to, when we plot lots of different figures. We've seen examples of that. We've plotted, um, or we've used things on the X and Y axis to also annotate a plot. But here what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a dictionary. So this is where a dict type is really useful in terms of co uh, collecting various properties of the things we want. A lot of the plotting functions that require um, a lot of inputs use dictionaries to organize all the inputs that they'd have. So I'm going to describe the bounding box for some text that I want. And I'm going to describe that the box style as round. Its face color is going to be blue. Its color of, I believe that's the text is red, although we'll see. Uh, the alpha, this is controlling the alpha parameters and a lot of plotting are controlling uh, transparency. So if you make this closer to one, it becomes more solid. And as it goes towards zero, it becomes more transparent, more see-through. 0.5, I kind of like for annotations when I'm, because when I'm plotting annotated bo like boxes that contain text or arrows, I don't like it to hide information on the graph. So I'd like to make it slightly transparent. And I find an alpha of 0.5 is generally nice. And then I have something involving the line width parameter that's describing the width of, the, of a boundary around it. Similarly, I'm going to have some arrow properties because I'm going to have a text box that has some information. It's going to point towards the root. The arrow properties, uh, this is the arrow style. And again, you could read more about this by looking up the uh, documentation involving annotate within PyPlot about all sorts of things like uh, how to add arrows and all sorts of you know, different types of information. But again, I'm just showing you how to do some of this right here. But I, there's an arrow style that I have to pick. I'm going to make the arrow black, alpha 0 0.5, and the width that's associated with the arrow is uh, 2. And then all I do for my annotation is I want to have the text approximate root be plotted within my box, my text box that I'm creating. I want its font size to be 12. This is positioning where that, um, I believe, this is, this is where I want the arrow to point to. I want it to point to the root. So this is the X, Y location of where the arrow should point to. This is the root location. Is at C, F of C, the approximate root location. Here's where I want the text box to be located. So I want to offset it to the left of the root, and I want to offset it above the Y axis. And then I'm also choosing a color uh, W. We can see what that's doing. And then I'm making my B box parameter equal to this dict parameter and the arrow props parameter equal to this dict arrow props um, value, variable that I've created here. So let's go ahead and run that. That was a lot of information about it. At the end, here you go. Okay, so I think I'd said red. This color here for the, ah, uh, that of course makes sense. The face color is blue. Color was red. That's for the box property. So the red is around the box. My color for my font is white when I do the annotation. But you had to see, this is kind of a lot more code that I had to write to add annotation. And you'll often see that when you're doing a lot of visualization of data that, or you want to tell a story with your data, which requires visualization, most of the lines of code you write are in, involved with how you're displaying the, the data and trying to tell the story you're trying to tell. Same thing here. I only needed a few lines of code to plot everything I wanted. I needed all this other code in order to add a title and in order to add this box with this text in it that was the saying, here's the approximate root with an arrow that points to and says, yeah, it's right here. So all of that's encoded and it really tells a story though. If you were to describe what a root is, a great way to do it is to have a plot of a function mark where the root is, and then maybe write, like if you were teaching this to somebody at, at a whiteboard or a blackboard or some other type of visual representation, you'd want to write like approximate root and point to the place where the function is crossing the x-axis because that's approximately where the function is equal to zero. And you can see it's approximately. It's, you know, it's equal to approximately negative 2.26 times 10 to the negative 3. That's how I have to read this uh, notation with this e, negative 0, 3. That's times 10 to the negative 3. That's a scientific notation. That's the approximate location of the root. You see this says 1.52 here, even though my root was 1.521. Why is that? That has to go with what, how I was uh, formatting this root right here with this uh, 0.3. If I wanted more, I could think I'd have to do 0.4 because I was saying basically three decimal places. If I did 0.4, let's run again. There you go, 1.521 because there's four digits right there. So this is just things that you can play with. So I'll just run it again. And there you go. All right. You might want to just play around with these properties, change some of these numbers around and see how it changes the plot before you move on to the next part of this video.
So that previous part of the video was over 11 minutes long, just talking a little bit about Lambda functions and a lot about how we create annotations and visualizations. And you might imagine that for a class of functions, like we could have a whole bunch of different functions that we want to repeat that above plotting routine, but we certainly don't want to write out all that code all over again. Also, the above code had some hard-coded elements to it that were based on our prior knowledge about where the root was located. And in more general cases, we will know the function we're interested in without knowing this data attribute. And we will want to quickly plot that function to quickly explore where a potential root may be for it so that we could perhaps then search for it, find some root finding algorithm to approximate it, and then it define that value and use it to annotate a plot kind of automatically. Now we could just functionalize the code above and functionalize all the routines we're talking about. However, we are interested in pursuing root finding and eventually integration later in this notebook. And a particular function does not exist in isolation from specific types of data attributes like its roots or integral, nor does it exist in isolation from the methods we wish, we wish to use to explore or visualize these attributes. So when you start to step back and think about this, all of these things are connected. And when various quote unquote types of things are intended to be used in some sort of integrated manner, this is a good indication that we should at least consider the use of classes to organize these various things as data or method attributes of an object because it just helps us keep everything organized. Thus, we're going to create a class of functions that are motivated by the common functions.py module that was explored in the prologue lecture for this, for this fourth module of this course. This class is instantiated for a given function perhaps defined by a lambda function. And it's useful for the purposes of this lecture notebook. Not only does this provide us with some more experience working with classes, but you might find this perspective of great use as you continue to mature as a software programmer, especially if you're programming for the purpose of doing some sort of data science or just scientific computing where object-oriented programming is incredibly pervasive. It's just everywhere. So in the code below, I want you to note how we have created a class with fairly short modularized method attributes that each serve a specific purpose in relationship to the current state of knowledge we have regarding the root of a function we are interested in studying. I have some suggested activities for you. You should add more information to the doc strings and you should provide more useful code comments wherever they are missing. So here's the class my functions, which is going to, I'm going to create objects based on this class. And this is a class that provides useful plots and information involving the root of a function. The way it's initialized is with a function and potentially with its root if we already happen to know it. Perhaps if we gave a polynomial in factored form, we'd already be able to specify a specific root we were interested in plotting and, and discussing. But it's going to be defaulted to a none type so that you don't need to know anything about the root when you first initialize this class. All you need to know is the function f that you're interested in, probably given as a lambda function in this notebook. And then you're going to assign that to self.f and self.root, which might be none. This Because if you didn't initialize it with any root, then this is just going to be given a none type. We have an option of setting the root to set the data attribute self.root to root, because if a function has multiple roots, you might want to change which one you're considering and wanting to plot and annotate. Or you might have to go find it with some algorithm, and then once you have an idea of it, you'll want to assign it using the set root method. And all it does is it sets the data attribute self.root using the set underscore root method. That's all it will do. And now we have a plot command. And in the plot command, we have several parameters here x min and x max, which are used to define the array that we're going to of x values for our plotting, along with n points that are defaulted to 100, but the user is allowed to control that. A fig num, which allows us to again control the number of figures that are created within our notebook and stored into memory. We're going to default the color to be blue, the line style to be solid, the line width to be two, and we're going to default show root to be false. And that's going to be something that would, if it's true, call another method attribute that would plot the root using that scatter function that we just saw in the previous part of this video. And then we would also have this annotate parameter that's passed around and defaulted to true so that if we did plot the root, the default is to also add an annotation, which is involving that boundary box and the arrow props. 
So that's kind of all the things that are in this function that are useful for what we want to do with functions in terms of exploring their roots and creating some plots that demonstrate this information for the user. Uh, you can go through this more carefully to just see how we're using, you know, ax.hline. Notice I'm not plotting, oops, I'm not plotting a typical y-axis because where the root is might not be near where x equals zero is, which is where the typical y-axis is. So I might not want to have that on my plot at all. So I typically am just going to plot the x-axis because I am interested in where the function crosses the x-axis. Where does it cross y equals zero? And then other than that, I just plot the function and notice how I use self.f because that's where the function f has been assigned as a data attribute to self.f, and I'm passing that x plot array to it, and then I'm just having all those other parameters that are defaulted in terms of the style of the, of the curve being plotted, uh, in terms of its color, line style, and line width. The annotations and the plotting the roots involving scatter, and if you do the scatter, you also plot the title there, because the title involved information around the root. If I don't know what the root is, I shouldn't have a title on the plot yet, so that's why it's not here. It's in the plot root command. And then there's the annotation. If annotation is true, it will do the annotation. I create these boundary the bounding box and arrow property uh, dictionaries. And then in order to annotate the plot, I do some automation as opposed to what I did in the, the code above where I used information about where the root was, C and F of C is approximately zero, in order to position my text box to where it could point to the root. I'm actually going to use information about the size of the graph, the size of the figure, the, the plus. I'm going to pick the, the Y min and the Y max values. I'm going to get them from the, the, the plot itself. And I'm going to figure out what the range, kind of how large this is, as well as the how large the X range is. And that's going to allow me, I did some tinkering to basically say, okay, I want to basically go 35% of the X range to the left of the root. I'm subtracting 35% of the range of X values from where the root is to position my text box. And I'm going to go 10% above the Y axis, 10% of the range above the Y axis. That's what this is doing. And then otherwise, everything else is really just the same. But this is just very, allows me to have the annotation be more automated and um, relative to whatever I'm plotting. So that's all that's in this in this class. So I know it can look like a lot. You could say, wow, I mean, we haven't studied many things where there's 80 or so lines of code. But most of it's plotting. Most of it's plotting, and it's just parsing out the information we saw in the previous code uh, from the previous part of the video about how to add some annotations to the plots. And so I'm going to go ahead and run that. And now I'm going to create some fancy functions. So I have that f that was this original lambda function that was the one I was looking at before involving that third order polynomial. But now I'm making it a little fancier because I'm creating it as a as a instantiation of my functions class. So now this is an object that's instantiated from this function. And so this is how you might use this class. I have a function, maybe a lambda function or some other functions defined, and I'm instantiating my functions, and now I have this f fancy. And now I could plot it. And let's say I plot it from negative 1 to 2, and this is going to be for the figure number 1, since I did figure number 0 before. I say, okay, there's the plot of it. And I would look at this and say, oh, it looks like the root is around 1.521. Maybe I know that. So then I perhaps I, I, I estimated it in some way, which is what I actually did for that problem. I used a bisection algorithm to estimate it. So I now can set the root using that set root method that's attached to this object, this F fancy object, using the dot convention. So I do that, and now the root is set. So now when I plot this and I say show root is true, because now I know it, right? When I go here, I'm not assuming that I know the root right away. So, but as soon as I set this to be true, I better have the root as something I can plot because it's going to be called here and it's going to want to know what self.root is. And if I try to call it before I've set this, that's going to be a problem because how are you going to scatter, how are you going to put something on a plot that's a none type? So you could try that to see if you get an error. Um, basically try to run this without it. So when I say true, there you go. Now it's annotating. It's in it. The annotation was defaulted to be true. I could show the root but have the annotation turned off because maybe the way I automated the annotation, maybe I find out, I go like, ah, I don't really like the position of the annotation. I just want to get rid of it. So you could say annotate the false and you're just running that. And then that when that plot methods run, it shows the root, but it's taking that annotation off of it. 
And then maybe I want to plot it without the root at all, because maybe I want to stop thinking about that root. Maybe there's other roots that I want to explore, but I just want to make the plot of the function again. And so there you go. I can set show root to be false, and there's the plot of the function. Now, here's another example that really illustrates why we do not want to plot the typical y-axis when we're doing this. So I'm going to notice the use of the lambda function in the creation of this object. I'm going to create a function that is in factored form of the third order polynomial. This was a third order polynomial. Here's a third order polynomial, except it's x minus 2,000 times x minus 5,000 times x minus 10,000, which means the roots are at 2,000, 5,000, and 10,000, which are kind of far away from x equals zero. And notice I, I just use a lambda function here. I never assign it a variable name or anything. I'm just passing that lambda function directly into my functions. And I create my second fancy function here with that. Now, look what happens when I plot this function from negative 10 to 10. That looks really flat, doesn't it? So what's going on here? Pay attention to the y-axis range. Look at what is up here, right? That's the thing you always have to kind of look at in that upper left corner if there's some big scales. This is 1e11. E so that's 1 times 10 to the 11th, which means it's a 1 with 11 zeros behind it. So that's, uh, let's see, that's 10 billion. That's kind of a lot. That I, I believe that's right. Wait, did I even have that right? 1e11? E I don't think I have that right. That's 100 billion. <laughs> there we go. I think I had an error in that. That's, that's a big number. I would say that's a pretty big number. Um, yeah, that, that, that's pretty large. So there's a large range going on here. The largest value of the function here is actually about negative uh, 10 billion. So it's below the the y -ax the x-axis, excuse me, see there's the zero. And the largest value of this function is about, oh, excuse me, not negative, it's, it's about negative 100 billion because it's negative one times that, yeah. So it's about negative 100 billion, in other words, for x, catching all my typos here, for x between negative 10 and 10, the function never gets closer than a distance of about 100 billion units from the x-axis, which means we are pretty far off from a root. So we happen to know where the roots are of this. If we plot x, let's say between 1,000 and, uh, what did I write here? Uh, I, I have typos all over the place. I think it's like 11,000. Yeah, 11, geez. Sorry, all these all these typos in my code comments, but at least they'll be fixed for you. If we plot x between 1,000 and 11,000, this will show where all three roots are located because we know what this polynomial is in fact and form. We also get the sense that the function is just a typical cubic polynomial. We do not require the typical y-axis here, which is again, is plotted at x equals zero, which is, you know, a thousand units to the left of where I'm even plotting things. So we really only need to again plot the typical x-axis, meaning y equals zero in our plots to see where a function may have roots. So I'm just going over this to just really emphasize you don't need the y-axis in order to study the, the root problem, but you do want to visualize the x-axis because that gives you information about where the roots potentially are in terms of where the function seems to cross that horizontal line. And so here I happen to know that one of the roots is 2,000 and I'm setting it to be 2,000 as a float, all right? And I'm saying it's got to be a float here. Try If you try using int, it won't be, but let, it, you'll get an error. Let's look at this first with 2,000, and I'll, and I'll do the plot between 1,000 and 3,000 after I set the root. And in fact, let me just go ahead and show if I say f fancy 2, and I want to plot between 1,000 and 3,000, fig num equals, let's say 5, just like this thing before. And I want to say show root equals true. I probably could have just, I should have just copied and pasted that. Let me just plot that. So I said, show root equals true. Actually, I guess when it's a none type, nothing happens. I thought it would have given an error. Okay, I thought it would have given an error. See, I learned something today. I thought that would have given an error. If you try to show root, then there's nothing happening. Well, I wonder if I say, and, and, well, the annotation I think is true when I do that as well. So there's nothing to even annotate. It just is when it's a none type, yeah. Huh, yeah, because annotate by default is true. Well, I'll be, I would have thought that was an error. So that would have given an error. I learned something. Just no roots plotted, so it's kind of silly to do that. But now I'll set the root to be 2,000. Okay, so I, I, that's interesting. I'm not going to edit the video. I'm going to leave my incorrect assumptions in there because I'm not always right about things. All right, so I set the root to be 2,000. I now show the root, which now adds the annotation by default. And you see it there, it's plotting it. It's plotting that part, just this part right over here of the curve. And it's annotating where the root is with that bounding box and the text and pointing to it. So that's very useful. But now if I actually do this 2,000, 
as an int, and I try to run it, you'll notice that we do get an error here, and it's involved with the idea of the precision is not allowed in integer format specifier. So if you see this value error, the issue with that is coming from here. Like it's pointing to this this line, but we're getting uh, it's it's from here when the root itself is an integer, and I'm saying, hey, do this decimal like show a certain number of decimals places with it but it's an integer it doesn't have decimal places that's what's causing the error it's just this is saying to get a certain number of decimal places of it's expecting a floating point so that's something coded in there which means you might if somebody's setting the root one thing you might consider to improve this class i'm not going to do it but i i encourage you to do it is when you set the root is you might want to if anyone does it is to do that as a float or if you say no the root is actually an integer i don't want it to be a float well then you need it to be a float here and so you might just in the one place that's causing a problem make that into you do a casting of a float right there and then that would fix it that would make the code a little bit more flexible um i'm just not doing that because i think you know it, that's a good little thing to leave for you to do if you want to do it and see if that resolves the error or not or how you maybe want to do it maybe you want to do it by fixing the casting of it up here or just cast it in the one place where it needs to be because maybe it's actually an integer and you want to leave it. The choice is yours. There's some design decisions that you get to make when it's your code. And I'm giving this code to you, so I'm going to say this is your code. All right, so that's kind of it in terms of providing us the idea of what a root is and how we can visualize it and how we can use a class to, to handle the organization of the code for us. But we haven't yet talked about why we care about roots. That will be in the next part of the video. Why should we care about roots? You should ask, is there anything particularly important about a function being zero? In general, the answer is no. However, it does depend on the function and the goals of the problem or application for which the function models some sort of system behavior. The assignment discusses how root problems arise naturally in many optimization problems, and we actually discussed that a bit in the Part C lecture notebook for Module 3, where we saw that where derivatives of a function are equal to zero is where maxes and mins have a tendency to occur in the original function. And so that's very useful if you want to maximize or minimize some function that maybe is related to profit uh, or revenue or whatever it is for some sort of company. So you can imagine all sorts of reasons why you might want to find where the roots of a derivative are what the roots of a derivative are in order to optimize a function. So that's where roots really come in a lot as an optimization. But we're going to provide some simpler motivating examples below that have really nothing to do with calculus. So suppose that we launched two projectiles with two height functions divided, denoted by h1 of t and h2 of t. And we are very interested when or even if there's a time when h1 of t is equal to h2 of t. In other words, is there a time where the objects can potentially collide? This is an important question that arises in missile defense systems, satellite monitoring, and autonomous vehicle guidance systems, because these h1 and h2 might also be just be positional things involving vehicles, positional functions involving vehicles, and you'd want to know if the two vehicles are supposed to be at the same position at the same time. That would be a problem. Those would be the vehicles crashing. So if you define a function f of t as the difference of the two functions, then guess what you're interested in knowing? Whether or not f of t is ever equal to zero, or if it is, when does that happen? At what time does that happen? Another example could be, suppose that you suppose that p of t describes a model you develop for the price of a potential investment. It could be in a savings or money market account, stock or mutual fund, to just name a few. You are probably interested in knowing when your model predicts the price to reach a certain target value, maybe P sub target, so that you can develop certain financial plans or goals around this time frame. For example, having enough for a down payment on a car or house to take a vacation or to retire. So if you define the function F of T to again be the difference, P of T minus P sub target, that means you're now interested in determining exactly when, when F of T is equal to zero. So these don't have anything to do with derivatives, these just have to do with functions involving the movement of, an up, of objects or prices, values, that can actually have some real important meaning. So that's kind of the why we should care about roots. But how? Okay, how do we solve roots? 
Well, there are lots of algorithms that attempt to approximate the roots of a function, and you can see this Wikipedia article on root finding algorithms for just a few. There's some key takeaways about this, though. Most algorithms are iterative, meaning we need to write loops to implement them. Some algorithms are very easy to implement, and some are more difficult. Generally, the easier something is to implement, the more restrictive the conditions are under which we expect it to produce anything meaningful, or the convergence rate just sucks. Both of these things are often true. So with that being said, that's the end of this first video that's just set the stage for what root finding problems are, how we can create a class of functions to visualize and annotate and basically tell a story about what's going on with the root of a function. The next video will actually discuss an algorithm for how we approximate the roots of a function.